I have the pleasure of uh, spending some time and chatting with one of the world's most noted and uh, popular, especially in Australia, and clearly talking from an Australian audience point of view, as I do. Um, thank you for joining me, uh, Peter Drury. Well, it's good morning. Good evening to you. Good thank to be you. with you. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be with you, let me just say. Um, normally, I hear these this voice at about 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. or 2 a.m. in the morning, because that's generally wow. our kickoff times, obviously, with the time <laughs> difference. But it's it's a pleasant voice, and yourself, along with uh, Mr. Beglin, Jim, um, are always welcome in our lounge room, especially if we're winning. That always helps as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and, and what I normally do with a guest is – I try to tell a bit of a story. So we go back and I guess um, I always ask, what is your first football memory? Well, I I guess it's kicking around in the backyard with my big brothers, actually, Um, as a five or six-year-old, very unremarkable. Um, So in the early 1970s, um, and I remember saying to my big brother, who shall I be, you know? And I was Bobby Moore, who lifted the World Cup for England in the year before I was born. Yeah. Um, believe you me, I never came close to Bobby Moore. But Not, not many uh, did. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and and uh, my early days, like everybody else who's played the game at any level on the planet, was kicking the ball around with brothers and friends. Yeah. Which, which other players, are, uh, as well as Bobby were childhood heroes of yours? Well, because Bobby Moore played for West Ham through my childhood, and obviously this has long since dissipated because of professional reasons and actually family reasons, but through my childhood, um, West Ham were, were the team that, that had me. So they, I loved diving around in a muddy goal mouth. So I, I loved the goalkeeper then who possibly, you well, you may because you're a football nostalgist, I've heard of a fellow called Mervyn Day. I certainly who was remember the goalkeeper yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. yeah, who was who was an England under twenty one goalkeeper. Uh, it's funny because one of his sons is now a very senior director in English sports television. I work with quite a lot. Okay. But uh, so Mervyn Day actually was my first real hero. Um, he, um, I remember my grandmother giving me a model uh, model skeleton to put together one Christmas. And when I put this skeleton together and hung it, I called it Mervyn. <laughs> um, and then, and then. After that, my big sort of outfield hero, beautiful, beautiful midfield player was Trevor Brooking, who played many times for England. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I I kind of idolised him as well. Yeah, he, he was an exceptional player. Um, yeah. And for a, such a classy, silky midfielder, he was a little bit taller than your, yeah. your standard midfielder, um, per se, from a, just a visual point of view but he was certainly silky oh he was beautiful he was beautiful i mean his critics would tell you he never made a tackle in a 20-year career uh, and uh, but listen that is that is so um that that is so failing to see the positive and and, and only see the negative um uh, he, he was graceful he had an eye for a pass funny enough i see kenny dalgleish over your shoulder there famous liverpool number seven um his predecessor in that shirt, Kevin Keegan uh, and Trevor Brooking, used to be a beautiful combination for England through Absolutely. the late 1970s. Yeah. I remember them making goals for each other. And, and uh, I, I remember as a, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 year old crying when Trevor Brooking scored a beautiful goal for England put through by Kevin Keegan. And of course, Trevor also scored the winner in the cup final in 1980. Yes. Um, for West Ham against Arsenal, and West Ham were a second division team then. Mm. Uh, and what, what I what I recall about that day, because I uh, we might go into this, but I never went to football. I didn't have the sort of dad who took me to football yep. matches. Yep. Um, but that day, I was playing cricket for the school, oh. uh, and it's the only time in my life, the only time, because it you know it doesn't take me to do this, that I more or less gave my wicket away so that I could go and sit in front of the television and watch West Ham. <laughs> Normally, my wicket gets taken away without me having any say in it. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, but, um, yeah, so I could see that cup final. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's interesting because you mentioned the cup finals, and, and we grew up um, here in Australia, especially the tragics like myself, I guess, and there are many. Um, 
with the, the cup final really being the only live coverage we would get for a whole of 12 months. And, and you know, the three o'clock kickoff would be midnight here and there would be FA Cup final parties and the like. And then your mainstream non-football fans will get involved because it was a big occasion. But because they hadn't watched a lot of football, watching sitting through 90 minutes was hard work. And then, yeah. the, then you get the normal Monday replies. But it seemed a bit boring. It seemed because they weren't used to watching mm. 90 minutes as such. <laughs> Edited highlights on a match of the day when you get all the, yeah. as, as it was the highlights, was a different uh, kettle of fish. But um, I do recall those three o'clock um, FA Cup Saturdays. Great they were, they were important and obviously become traditional. It seems that for lots of reasons, which, we, again, we may discuss, uh, the FA Cup has lost a little bit of its luster along the way, hasn't it? Well, I, sadly, I think it has. I, I, I like to be in denial when I'm asked that question because I, I love the FA Cup and, and want to believe in it. And I, I always say um, that for me, the FA Cup is like Santa Claus. If you believe in it, it remains real. Yeah. You know, the moment you're in denial. Okay. Um, so I believe in Santa Claus. Santa Claus visits me on Christmas Eve and yes. the FA Cup visits me every year as well. No, that's, that's, that's a good way of putting it. That's a great <laughs> way of putting it. You mentioned um, West Ham were your childhood uh, club or your, the team that you supported, uh, but it changed or has changed. What, what has changed? Well, obviously going into this job dilutes it, but also yeah. um, family dilute these things. And as I say, I was, I was a, a football supporter by radio on the whole, because as yeah. you say, there wasn't so much live television then, but also television uh, highlights and so on. Um, and the West Ham result really mattered to me. But actually, um, as my career began to get going um, and my family began to get going 25, 26 years ago, uh, I moved into uh, the house I live now in Hertfordshire, northwest of London. Um, and my now 26-year-old became four or five years old, started talking football as they do and started saying things like Manchester United and Liverpool because they were the most famous teams. Yep. And I said, no, some will take you to the local team. Um, and the local team happened to be Watford. OK. Um, who've just been relegated out of the Premier League. Yeah. So... <laughs> Um, so we have had, a, and he's had two younger brothers since who are all now grown up. Um, but we've had a lovely 20 years and more as a family, my wife and I, the three boys, uniting around Watford, who've been up and down and up and down. And, and you know, nobody can be um, offended by a Watford supporter because they're pretty harmless. Uh, it's a lovely family club. The boys grew up there on the sort of in the family stand watching average championship football and we've just had five glorious years in the Premier League which came to a shuddering end and we're settling back into um, what feels like a natural <laughs> habitat but <laughs> no, we might come back but I, I, I always have to say this George forgive me for being overly defensive no people do wor people do worry about um, commentators who appear to have an allegiance and let me say not just on behalf of myself but on behalf of all the other guys you ever hear um, when you're up there doing it, whether it's your team or not, you've got enough on without supporting your team as well. I promise everybody, on behalf of all, it's a completely different mindset. And if you think you hear a commentator who is biased, I'm telling you, um, you're not hearing that. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, it's my job to be as excited for goals against as goals for. And, and that's oh, absolutely. It yeah. And it's funny yeah. because we, we, in the build-up to this, we did discuss, you know, social media and whatever. And, and, and I'm on Twitter and I try to keep it and use it for uh, good and not evil, um, which, which, which I, I seem to manage. Um, I, and I follow and read a lot about Liverpool stuff because it comes onto my feed. And there seems to be this overwhelming dislike, let's just use that word, keep it nice, of Martin Tyler's commentary and Martin Tyler has always been one of my favourite commentators. And there's this yeah. utter dislike of his commentary towards Liverpool and uh, an apparent bias towards Manchester United. And I'm a I'm pretty one-eyed Liverpool supporter, but I, I, I look at the feed, I read these tweets, and then I click onto the, the video and I don't hear it. I just don't hear it. And there's no. thousands of well, thousands of people criticising the man and I, and I just can't see it. 
Well, listen, I mean, I, I bump into Martin every week uh, and I've got to tell you, he is neither a Manchester United fan nor a Liverpool fan. Um, he, I mean, one person's favourite commentator is another person's biggest irritant. I get yeah. that. And, you know, whether you like us or don't like us, that's that's there's not a whole lot we can do about that. Um, but one thing you can't accuse him of, I have got to say to you, is bias because he's not. Yeah, no, I, I just don't <laughs> see it. It's just one of no. those weird things that social media and I just will never agree on. No. That's the way, I just don't see yeah. it. And it's funny enough, I don't think I've ever felt um, that I, in any of the games that I've listened to that there has been any bias from a commentator. Occasionally, perhaps with the special comments guy, I have <laughs> noticed it. But I reckon if you've played for 20 years and you've got history against other clubs or other players, it's almost impossible not to let yeah, that... It's that's a really interesting one, actually, because because particularly Sky in our country um, have gone down the road of having co-commentators who are very obviously aligned to one club. Now, that might sound an obvious thing to say because, you know, most famous players are fairly aligned to one club. But in sort of Gary Neville, he is more Manchester United than it's practically possible to be. And Jamie Carragher with Liverpool and so on. Correct. Um, and, and they've decided, in a sense, to to rather than be in denial about that to engage it because those are the biggest two clubs and so they've sort of set up a rivalry between those two yeah, and that's kind of how it is now i would argue again on behalf of both of those two that even whether or not they are dealing with their own club they are still both very very good readers of the game and uh if you're prepared to uh allow for the fact that once in a while they're going to punch the air or slump their shoulders when it goes against I, I think if you listen to what they have to say, they they actually offer an awful lot. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, yeah. We don't yeah. get a lot of the pun. Oh, actually, we do get a bit of it. We don't get Jamie and Gary um, in in our feed. Uh, yeah. On a, we get Michael Owen and yes, Rocky and whatever. Just a different feed. Um, it's always yeah. good to get that. But through social media, if there's any, if there's a yeah. headline or a grab or, or fake news. Yeah. You, you'll catch up on it pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, that doesn't take long. Um, at what point growing up or when you were getting into the workforce, at what point did you start to think that this was something that you wanted to do? You mentioned earlier about listening to radio as um, your main source of football. Take us back to that as well. Yeah, well, I, I, I really did. I mean, on a Saturday afternoon back in the day when sort of all football was 3 o'clock Saturday afternoon, I, I used to go upstairs, lock my bedroom door at one o'clock and not emerge again till six o'clock, you know, yep. listening to the great, the great voices of that time. Peter Jones was my hero, a beautiful, beautiful radio commentator in his time and Brian Butler and, and many, many others. Um, so, yeah. And, and then, you know, gr growing up in the UK, one of the sort of rites of passage was when you were old enough to stay up and watch match of the day, you know, with the, 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 um, highlights which were generally on at sort of 10 30 at night way beyond the reach for six year old and seven eight and yeah. I, you know i remember when there was a special game at nine being able to stay up and actually falling asleep before the you know program started and all of those sorts of things that you did um and it continued and, and to be honest i retained my fascination for the way football was broadcast all the way through you know i i was i was a bit of a tragic on that as as uh, you call them in in oz um, and uh, so, you know, that was that. There was nothing unremarkable about that. Um, I never thought for one moment it would become a career. Um, but when I came out of university at the age of 21, um, I went to be a trainee accountant. Uh, and I was a trainee accountant for one month. And during that month, uh, I thought, I can't do this forever. <laughs> and that, you know, that that's not... Um, that's not said at the expense of accountants who are very, very important people and do a job that I respect hugely because yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. Um, but I thought now's the time I'm, I'm going to have a go. Uh, so I, I handed in my notice um, left after that month. Uh, and, uh, you know, my dad was horrified, obviously. Um, and um, started writing letters, you know, and getting piles and piles of rejection because I had no qualification of any sort. And eventually I got a chance in this sports reporting agency in London and, and did a couple of really important grounding years in sports journalism. And, and it went from there. So 
I, I guess that was the first really lucky, lucky break to get the job I did because it was a respected agency. I got wonderful experience for not very much money and it set me on my way. So was that sports writing as such? Yeah, writing, pr yeah. Uh, principally writing, actually. Yeah. yeah, you know, I used to go and, and, and report games for, for the national press. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and that was a, a fantastic thing. A bit of broadcasting as well. Um, in, in a sense, it was about the contacts within the industry that, that um, you know, re that, that's what really mattered. I mean, the guy, it, it was an agency called Haters, which was, read, which was um, run by a, a then legendary Fleet Street man called Reg Hater. And uh, now, sadly, no longer with us, who was a very flamboyant, old school, big drinking sports journalist of, the, you know, of that type and, and who was pretty famous uh, back in the day. He was he was one of Ian Botham's first agents. Okay. And he, you know, he knew the cricket world inside out and, and football as well. Everybody knew him. And and kind of the deal was and, and I was one of many fortunate to um, benefit from this. He didn't pay you very much. He made all the money but he made you a career and that's how it's worked out for, for me and for many others. Yeah. When you went with that, did you think you had a flair for it or did you, and was it, or was it just a passion and you wanted to explore it or did you, did you think there was something already in, in you that was going to be good at it? Oh, I, it kind of didn't occur to me whether I was good at it or not. I, all I knew was I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and, and it struck me that if I could if I could earn a living this way, why would I want to do real work? Yeah. Um, you know, it was it was um, it was it was just every day was a buzz, you know. And, and here was, you, you know, in, in those early days, I used to go and watch lower division teams in London, uh, you know, Leighton Orient and Brentford and all of those teams and, and cover the games. And and there wasn't a game I went to where. I thought anything other than, wow, this is so exciting. And it might play into the fact that until I was 18 years old, I didn't go to a professional football game. Okay. You know, so in three years on, I was actually, you know, by then I had, of course, been to a lot of students and so on once I became a sort of independent young man. But I was, I was still excited by the floodlights and by the perfect green pitch as, as sort of six-year-olds are. Yeah. And, um, and to be paid to do all that uh, was, was fantastic. Yeah. And did you develop your own style? Were you in terms of your writing or your reporting? Because obviously it's it's transformed well into something of an art form and some near enough poetry with your commentary. Obviously the base and the writing would have helped that. What what was your ideas behind that? What well, yeah, I, I didn't. Again, I didn't really have an idea. I, you're, you're, you're giving me credit for having some sort of rationale and sense, which I don't have. I mean, every, everything's completely random. Um, what I do remember is that my boss became um, exasperated with what I suppose you might call my style, but w was just my shortcoming, really. And it still is. It's a sort of strength and a weakness. I, I've always been far too wordy. And, you know, when I was writing essays at school, the teacher used to put red lines through saying, you know, you've used 75 words to describe what you could describe in 10. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yeah, as a writer, certainly um, he used to, he did, as I say, like a school teacher, he used to put lines through the sort of unnecessary adjectives. Um, so so that occurred. Um, but I was, I suppose, quite cussed about it because. Uh, again, for better or worse, and it's up to others to decide which, I, I've always loved words, you know, so I, I kind of carried on using them <laughs> despite that. Yeah. Um, and um, sort of eventually, I suppose, got away with it. Okay. You mentioned Peter Jones earlier. I'm going to try and share a file here, and I'm going to hope to all goodness that it works for us. On the left, control, end of the box. It's two challenges, gets a shot. It, it comes to Hockey Ball. Inside left position, Leon from the edge of the Arco Penalier. He'll take it to the byline. Pulls across, back into dangerous one. It's played forward by Cross, and it's in. It's one of the goals. Well, certainly Peter Holmes will know what it's like on extra time because he played here, but
those sound bites on just a well actually that's what I've got it on a little yeah. plastic single which because of the green screen you can't see but it's a green little yeah. thing that I found in Match Magazine 40 odd years ago and it was a quiz competition and by the time we got it here in Australia it was about three or four months behind so we couldn't enter it wouldn't have mattered <laughs> um, and from those sound bites um, I saw pictures I mean you know I mean I could see I could make up pictures from reading Shoot magazine, but when you get audio as well, yeah, um, as good as that commentary, yeah, um, there's pictures being painted in my head. Um, oh, he he was he was the best. I mean, he 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 was the best. I, oddly enough, I've spoken about him a fair bit over the last couple of years, and when when somebody first brought him up, um, I I said, listen, he was inspiring. Um, and outstanding i uh, said in a way i don't want to listen again because i fear he might be dated and that it might not work um and then i listened to it it's not at all no it's absolutely brilliant yeah. and and uh, what strikes me is listening to those clips i'm bobby stokes the 76 cup final when southampton beat man united you know that was a crazy day um but never mind the football if you listen to him he actually he actually sings he sings. Yeah. There's a, there's a, you know, that it's a series of notes. You could almost write it down, not the words, but the music. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how he brought it alive together with an uh, extraordinary vocabulary. The guy just used words to, to bring it alive. And of course, um, that's radio commentary. You know, there is a pe people sometimes don't understand, um, including people who should know better, really. <laughs> that, that, that there's, there's a big difference between radio and television commentary. And Peter Jones was absolutely the master of his art. He was, he was outstanding. Yeah. no, And obviously it was just the fluke that um, in, in the research I looked it up and then I remembered I had that little thing and I thought mm. That's, there's a good chance that that will be Peter Jones. I, I didn't know. Um, mm. and, and luckily for me it was and I could put that mm. together for you. But I just know that over the years I continually play that every now and then and now I've turned it into a, a proper soundbite file on the computer so I don't have to put the record player on every <laughs> time. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, the, just the, the idea of Ronnie Whelan running all over Wembley, um, yeah. it just paints such an amazing picture, um, especially if you go back the 40 odd years to when I had it. We did, like I said, mm. we had at that stage one hour of live football a week. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, and I also listened to the BBC World Service um, because, again, we were starved of television, um, you know, one hour a week of highlights, shoot magazine coming out on the boat three months after it was released in the UK. We were yeah. always playing catch-up. So BBC World Service became a fascination. And I, I'm lucky enough to... Um, I don't know if you remember Johnny Method who w went. Yes. To, yes. And that free kick against Arsenal that he hit that one that sort of went over the wall and seemed to take yes. the crossbar. He scored a famous goal against West Ham too. Yeah. One month um, past Phil Parks. Correct. And absolutely thundered. I listened to this on the radio. So the crowd, the commentary, and I could not wait to see the footage. Yeah. I had to wait weeks to, to, to marry yeah. the two up, you know. Um, but it painted. He had the same hairstyle as you and me. Just about to, yeah. You're being, <laughs> you're being very kind to him, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so we, we, I share those memories. I mean, I didn't do it for long, for a long period, but I did get some amazing games. Portsmouth coming down when they were on top of the second division. Alan Byley scoring two late goals. Yeah. You know, in the 89th and 90th minute, and the crowd. You could hear the crowd. And I'm in my bed. It's 2 a.m. 
and I should be fast asleep. But, you know, as a teenager, I just wanted to draw this in. And, and the commentary plays such an important part to telling the story. Let me tell you, when, when I was fortunate enough um, to join the BBC radio sports department, which for me, if it had stopped them, was enough. Because yeah. like you, I, that, that, was, that was actually my dream, yeah. BBC radio sport, because that had meant so much to me in my childhood. When I got the chance on a Saturday afternoon for the first time to say, and at this point we welcome the World Service, wherever you may be, which, was the, which were the words that Peter Jones used to use, yeah. Uh, sort of midway through the second half. And at this point, we welcome the World Service wherever you may be. He used to say, and, and when I got to say that, that, that was one of the hairs up on the back of my neck moments because the thrill of knowing, and, and you've just articulated it, that someone somewhere in the world, whatever the time is, right around the 24 hours of the clock, is hanging on, you know, who's going to score next. That, that as a broadcaster, is an incredible thrill. Yeah, yeah, because in that imaginary world or in our own little world, we're not sure who's listening. Is there anyone listening? Does anyone care? But when you actually get that affirmation that someone has been oh, listening, yeah. it certainly makes a difference. Yes, it does. No, a huge difference. And, and oddly enough, uh, coming right up to that, that's the thrill I get now because I'm lucky enough to, to broadcast the Premier League to the world. And, and I can think of, of you at three o'clock in the morning and I can – think of people huddled around their televisions in Ghana and Kenya and, you know, masses of people who watch these games in India and so on. And that, I, I, that gives, gives me, uh, I hope this doesn't sound egotistical, but it, it, it gives me a real kick. No, uh, it should do. Aware though I am that, that people are tuning in for the football match. And yeah. it's just great to be that conduit between people everywhere and this football match that they, they want to see the outcome of. Yeah. Not long ago, I, I chatted with, I don't say interview because I can't interview, I chatted with one of our iconic commentators, Mike Hill, who was an Englishman who migrated to Australia back in the late 60s, early 70s, and he became our, the voice of our football, and he was superb and became a, an iconic, um, you know, voice on the TV, and it's part of all those old matches that we watch now with nostalgia. Um, and obviously I got to speak to him and hear the voice again, but it, it was just like the voice of my youth um, all over yeah. again. Um, yeah. Just it's like it was, And I described it to him, it's like when you hear a favourite song, it transports oh, yeah. you to the place and time you were when you first heard it or when you enjoyed it the most or you can remember certain periods. And, and as I was doing the research, um, putting together some info for our chat, um, obviously – some names come up and, I, and I, we'll, we'll discuss them. But John Motson was one of my favourites. And he's two words which I'll call a soundbite. And Zico transports yeah. me back to 82 yeah. Espana. Like yeah. instantly, if I hear that soundbite, I'm gone. I'm, I'm in the 1982 World Cup. So yeah. commentators can have a huge effect like a song, like, like a hit song, like a memory yeah, well, it, that's exactly right. I mean, Motti in the 1980s go hand in hand. And, and by the way, well into the 1990s as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he was certainly a large part of the soundtrack of my youth. And those World Cups, especially um, back in the day when technology wasn't so good and the sound wasn't so pure. No, it so wasn't. It sound. was a kind of an echo. Yeah, and there's that muffled, far away sound, yeah, yeah. which makes it sound much more exotic now. Everything it's satellite, everything could it's be, a satellite, <laughs> satellite. Yeah, but everything could be next door now. Yes. Everything could. Everything's so yeah. good and pure that it, you know you don't get that thing of wow. He's 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 not you know in Liverpool or Manchester. He's in Spain or Mexico, and yeah. and um, you know that that was that was great and. It, and when I was growing up, there were three principal commentators. There were two on the BBC who were John Motson and Barry Davis, yeah. who were two, both of them, brilliant operators, but Absolutely. very different, very different. And, it, you know, it used to be one of those arguments. Are you a Motson man or a Davis man? You know, okay. and, yeah. and, and, and on the ITV, which I went on to join um, uh, and had uh, 12 or 14 years there, there was a guy called Brian Moore who yeah. was also a very, very stylish commentator with a beautiful, deep baritone voice. And that, I mean, there were others, of course, and, yeah. and everybody would have their favorite. But those were the, those three. the three. Yeah. And and um, of course, now we live in an age, mercifully, 
where there are so many of us that that you don't you don't have to live with this kind of voice of thing uh, because because the whole industry has expanded yeah and um I always say this to young people anyway, who, who say, what do I do to become a commentator? I said, please don't do it because you want to become well-known. To the extent that I'm well-known, I don't like that. Yeah. I don't like it. I hate, I hate, I hate it all. That's why I don't do social media and all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, um, what I'm saying is that there's a, there's a great glut of us now. And so nobody can claim to be the voice. Nobody, there is no him against him in quite the same way as there must have been. And it, for those guys back in the 1980s, it must sometimes have felt a bit personal because, you know, Shoot Magazine, might, for instance, that you speak about getting three weeks late. You know, they used to ask footballers, Motson or Davis. Yeah. And, you know, you know Motson or Davis and it's not you. You're thinking, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know we, we don't have that now. Yeah. No, well, they're, 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 um, one of the things that I discovered and was thinking out, well, internally, was John Champion. Yeah, good friend of mine. Yeah, and he seemed to be another voice of the EPL along himself and then disappeared. So in my research, I've discovered, but he seems to have um, moved on to ESPN in the States. Am, am I on the main? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's their main man for the MLS. Made a big, big life choice, career move and, and so on. Um I was texting him just the other day, and uh, yeah, he's he's making a go of it. Big big family choices for him, and so on. Um, big brave move, and I think I mean obviously COVID has ruined the world for all of us. Yeah. But uh, within those parameters, I think it's working for him, and he's very happy. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good guy. We're we're godfathers to each other's kids. Oh, wow. Sensational. Um, it's funny because the Mike Hill that I was just speaking about disappeared off our televisions and from our football um, and no one knew where he was and everyone was too scared to ask the obvious question. Um, but he had moved to the States to work for ESPN and to be the voice <laughs> of their international broadcast. So he actually became a, a football export of ours, much like uh, some of our footballers, but no one here knew. They just thought he'd quit and moved oh. on or had... Passed on. There's no yeah. one, you know, disappeared off the face of the earth. But uh, yeah, John Champion was another one that I found was a really Out, easy great voice. commentator. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, Absolutely. yeah. And, and you're right. I and mean, with the amount of live football on, it's impossible to have just two voices these days. You you, yeah. you need to um, have as many as possible. And when <laughs> yeah. you know, we get the, the championship that's live, and obviously all the other feeds from Italy and Spain and whatever. Yeah. Um, so, it's important, obviously, that, the, like you said, don't go in for it for the fame, but go in no. because you love it. You mentioned yeah. COVID. Um, I'm interested to know what that has had, if any, effect on what you do from a day to day now when you go to a stadium as compared to before. Not, not really now. I mean, obviously, when everything stopped, everything stopped. But yeah. since we've been back... Um, my routine is pretty much the same. Um, the actual broadcast, we've learned to live with these weird circumstances. I, I mean, I have the artificial crowd noise in my ear, so I've got something to ride on. Okay. Um, but it, it's it's uh, but that that's been the main awkwardness, or, or was to start with. Um, if if you think about commentary from way back, um, why did commentators shout when the ball went in the net? Well, one, because they were excited, but also two, because there were 40,000 other people shouting oh, and that, that yes. was the natural thing to do. Yeah. So how do you react when there aren't 40,000 other people shouting? And, and to start with, there were one or two saying, you know, when somebody scores, we should just remain conversational in the way that I'm talking to you now. And um, mercifully, that's not the way we chose to go Good. because it just would, would sound yeah. Yeah. would sound even more weird. But it, it is funny because obviously at any given game, there are radio commentators and two or three television commentators, perhaps from different uh, parts of the world. Um, and if you have a second, if I choose to let it breathe for a second and take my headphones off, you know, you can hear these other voices booming around the stadium. And that makes you aware that your voice is, is booming around the stadium. There was a there was a match towards the back end of last season, which I was commentating on, which um, five minutes from the end of which, there were actually, funnily enough, it was at Watford. Um, and Watford had to score a penalty to have a realistic chance of staying up. Massive moments in their season. Um, and so the guy taking the penalty, a fellow called Troy Deeney, 
he steps back. I stopped talking for a while, but I heard one of the other commentators who was 20 yards away from me saying, this is the biggest kick of Watford season. Troy Deeney won't kick a more important football than this as long as he lives. This to keep Watford alive, more or less. And I'm thinking, he can hear that. He can, can never mind. I can. Yeah, yeah. He can hear that. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm thinking. I wonder what the greater pressure is to have twenty, thirty thousand people booing, hissing, shouting, or <laughs> to hear just one bloke absolutely saying in plain black and white, "You miss this. It's all it's, over." Pal. It's all over. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it's so that's quite it. I'm, listen, I'm not so vain as to believe that the footballers out there are listening to what every word the commentators are saying. Of course, no. they're not. But, but it is an interesting um, new dynamic. But it's, it's horrendous. Don't get me wrong. Oh, horrendous is too strong a word. It's, it's terribly flat, really, in the stadium without yeah. the fans. I mean, you, if we've learned anything over the course of this, it is how much we ought to value the paying spectator. Because the reason televised football is such a phenomenon in the modern age is essentially because of that backdrop because it is an event, because people are there and there's a partisanship and there's a noise and a buzz and a thrill. Um, and we're getting away with it at the moment. Uh, it partly helps because it partly helped by the fact that the football is so remarkable. Yeah. You know, we're, we've had a, we've had a remarkable start to the season. Yes. Um, but it, it won't be properly right until everybody's back again. The, there is only all of us in the media. Forgive me for I'm saying this tongue in cheek um, and very cynically, all of us in the media have only one bonus to take out of this. And that is that after the game, we can get in the car and drive straight away without uh, queues. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no traffic jam out. Traffic. You go to Old Trafford, if you park anywhere near the ground at Old Trafford and there's 70,000 in, it's two hours before you're into second gear. Yeah. And now you're on the motorway in 10 minutes. But that is a very, very small bonus amongst several um, negative factors yeah no i, I understand um <laughs> for the uninitiated who wouldn't know you would do say a saturday sunday possibly a monday night game through a weekend maybe even more um and do you drive to all of those games how do you get to, to yeah eat? well in normal times i tend to take because i live in the south of england yep. and uh you know, Manchester and Liverpool, where so many of the big games are. If it's not Liverpool, it's Everton. If it's not United, it's City. You know, um, obviously, are up in the north of England. Yeah. Uh, now, listen, our country is not as big as your country. Uh, but uh, even so, it's a three or four hour drive each way. Yeah. Uh, and so, it, you know, it's not ideal to be driving. So normally, uh, I take the train. But at the moment, I'm, I am driving. Yeah. Because, um, because we're warned against public transport. Um, I've, I've been on a couple of trains, but broadly speaking, it's considered preferable if you drive. So there you are. Um, that's a lot. And, and I get tired more quickly. I have to say, I hate to admit it, but, yeah. uh, you know, that sounds like getting old, but it's, no, it, it's, it does it's, take it's a, a lot of driving. Yeah. It's a lot of driving. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 Um, I, and I must say, when I, I woke up at about 12.30 this morning, as guys our age tend to do um, <laughs> yeah. and my son was watching man united and tottenham and i can't see without my glasses so i was squinting and he knows the, the story call the score out for me because it's going to take me forever to read what's on the screen he reads out <laughs> the score and i said i'm not interested and he said well what are you standing there i said i'm trying to listen to who's commentating because i didn't i could obviously hear your voice um um and then was it was the Man U Tottenham game you're at? Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. And then I yeah. thought, well, that's not good because when I get up in a few hours to watch our game, you won't be <laughs> at, at our game. So I was <laughs> secretly disappointed about that. Um, but um, well, I tell you, on that Sunday, uh, I <laughs> I um, I left Old Trafford thinking I'd seen, you know, the the result of the season. Drove home listening to the radio, and by the time I got home, it hadn't. It wasn't even the result of the day. No. <laughs> Oh, and, I, and I'm blaming you and Jim for not being there as the whole reason behind it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, it was just one of those horrendous days that I could either wipe off in 30 seconds or spend the next four hours telling you where we went wrong. Um, we'll keep it very – we won't go with the four-hour <laughs> version. Trust me, you don't want to hear it. Um, <laughs> the other thing was um, in terms of who – the allocation of games, who decides that? Does the network decide you the get boss. a choice? Okay. No, no. I mean, listen, don't get me wrong. When the next set of fixtures comes out, 
I, you know, there, there might be a little bit of interaction, but broadly speaking, um, I go where I'm told to go. Yeah. That's, those that's are the rules. Simple as that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. All right. No, that's good. Um, I do want to talk about Mr. Beglin. Uh, yeah. You do spend a fair bit of time with Jimmy. Um, yeah. As, I mean, I obviously know you work with other people as well, but that seems yeah. to be the the preferred partnership for the for the for the boss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> tell us about working with Jim. Yeah, well, it's a joy. It's a joy. I mean, he's he's just a very very nice guy. Um, we we funnily enough first worked together um, with BBC Radio in the mid nineties when his career came to a premature end. Um, which is a shame, and people ought to know that he was a very, very fine footballer. Oh, he was you know, he he was a part of the Liverpool team that won the double in 1986. Absolutely. And if if you speak to Doug Leash or Hanson or Lawrenson, they'll tell you how good he was. Yeah. And it's a real sadness, and, and and it's part of the reason I admire him. You know, he had it all, and then he had nothing. Um, his his career with what was then the greatest club in England, and is again now as it happens but yeah. was then far and away the greatest club in England was torn away from him and he went and had a little spell principally at Leeds and he helped Leeds get promoted the last yeah. Leeds team to be promoted Jim yeah. was in it but um there was it, it was clear that he wasn't going to be able to play at the top level again so once they were promoted that was more or less him done yeah uh, and so it's a great shame but but to his great credit he reinvented himself um and so yeah so we first worked together in the mid 90s uh, then again, through the 2000s, because he and I, as it happened, both uh, got contracted to ITV, the sort of big commercial network in, in the UK. So we did a lot of Champions League and World Cups and things together there. Um, and then again, it's, it's like we sort of, uh, our planets keep colliding um, because then, you know, this, the, this sort of global Premier League entity came about and, um, and that's worked for us too. And it, it's, it's a real pleasure because he's a very, very humble guy. He's an excellent reader of the game. Um, he and he also has very sharp eyes. You know, you talk yeah. about having to put your glasses on. I mean, I, you know, me too these days. And if, if it's extraordinary, I can, if I'm not sure who scores, I can look at him and he'll mouth it to me. Or yeah. you know, he yeah. knows. He yeah. always knows. Yeah. And um, he, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, he, you know, you say we spend a lot of time together. He, he you know, he said to me the only the other day that he sees more of me than his wife. You know, and and that's probably right. Um, and we are a bit like an old married couple. You know, we finish each other's sentences now. Yeah. Fair. Um, and and that's that's great. That's not a bad thing. No, not at all. No. And and I, my and I know there's many. He's a good footballer. Had a great career. And he, as you said, was an integral part of that uh, double winning team. But my my lasting memory, um, and it probably shouldn't be, but is of him and Grobbler. Standing up, up, pushing him and complaining about yeah. um, that interaction that they had with the back pass and whatever. Um, but it finished well on the day and it ended He's up. He's great mates with Grobbler, by the way. He's I can imagine they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bruce, Brucey would have driven everyone mad on the pitch and would have yeah. been number one off the pitch. I, I have no yeah. doubt. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that, that, that was a special day, um, especially for us Australians as well, because Craig yes. Johnson. Craig Johnston. Well, um, yeah. yeah. Played. Um, Tell us about the ITV gig in Euro 96, because that seemed to be about when you transferred from radio. Well, Euro 96, actually, you know, Euro 96, I was still with the BBC. Okay. I was still on the radio then. Yeah. That was my first major tournament. Um, but World Cup 98 was the start of ITV. Oh, okay. Um, so that was my big sort of television break, because the commentator who I just referred to earlier, Brian Moore, announced that he was going to retire at the end of that World Cup. So ITV came and recruited me ahead of that World Cup. And I went as the sort of uh, junior commentator to France in 98. Yeah. Um, and so had 14 years there, which was great, actually. Um, several World Cups, um, uh, you know, principally the, the sort of staple diet was the Champions League. So, some, you know, over that period, I got to visit all of the major stadia in Europe, which for a you know, a fan like me is fantastic. And Milan and Munich and Barcelona and Madrid. And, and, you know, that was, a that was, th those were key years of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Just going back to Euro 96 as a, as a fan, not a, not a, a worker. What are your memories of that tournament as an England fan? Yeah. As an England fan, it's, it's, um, it's odd because I was a worker, but I was, you know, I, I wasn't doing the England games. 
I was uh, I was doing games in Nottingham and Leeds and so on, um, and and really enjoying that. For what I what I remember is the day England played Scotland, um, the uh, the biggest football match sort of imaginable in this country, yeah. and the biggest game some were saying since the World Cup final of '66 and so on, um, and um, how many children did I have then? Maximum two, probably still just one. Yeah, still just one. And my wife took our child out to the sort of the steam engine fair that afternoon, <laughs> 20 miles from our house. Um, and I settled down to watch England, Scotland. I was going up to Sheffield the next day to do Denmark against Croatia or whatever. Yep. I had the house to myself, settled down, put the television on. And we'd only just, I think, got mobile phones then. And yeah, uh, 20 right. minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes into the game, my phone went and it was her saying that she dropped the car key in the grass somewhere and um, <laughs> she needed me to come out and rescue her. And so uh, I missed the rest of England, Scotland, driving out to... No way. So that, that, that's, that's <laughs> as I arrived, she found the key. So, so that was quite... I mean, I listened to it on the radio, but that was quite funny. But then... Um, my tournament ended because of where I was in the pecking order at about the quarterfinal stage. Yeah. And actually, I went, we went with friends on holiday after that to a little uh, holiday cottage in the north of France, which, as you know, is just a little hop yeah. across the sea for us. Yeah. And um, we watched the famous semi-final and Gareth Southgate's penalty miss um, there with a French commentator who probably spared us the, the pain and partisanship that we would have felt. You yeah. Know. Yeah, no, I can imagine that. Um, <laughs> you would have seen the um, Michael Owen won the goal. Um, did you? Were you at at that match, or no, were you? No, no. I'll tell you who did that game for the BBC in '98. For the BBC, that game was done by John Champion. Okay. And by um, it was uh, live on ITV in this country, and that was Brian Moore, who um, and for those big England games, funnily enough. Uh, I was, and it shows again how technology has moved on. I mean, I was going all over France covering the games that I had to cover. But for the big England games, they always dragged me back to Paris to sit in the studio just in case the line went down and yeah. they needed someone to, um, you know, to, to take over in an emergency. Yeah. So I had this, this kind of terror. I guess it's like being a perpetual substitute. You know, you're prepared yeah. and you don't get to get a game. Yeah. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, so so uh, I I just remember sitting there in the production office watching it and going wow, along with everybody else. Yeah. 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 Speaking of um, reading it off a monitor, um, watch what I mean. Obviously, when you have to do it, you have to do it. I get that. Yeah. Um, how difficult is it? Well, it what it what I always say, and it's it's a bit extreme this, but being at the ground and commentating is really commentating. Yeah. Sitting and doing it off a monitor is pretending to commentate. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's it's yeah. a kind of it's a, for me, it's a slightly pale imitation. It, you're right. It's necessary for all sorts of reasons, sometimes logistical. Often I understand financial. You know, I get that. Yeah. It's it's all very well for the likes of me to be blase and complain and say, why aren't we going? And uh, the answer is, well, because it costs us a plane ticket and a you know commentary position and an engineer and a producer and all of that. So I get that. Yeah. Um, but the, for me, uh, the job of a commentator is to articulate the event. And if you're sat in a sterile room with a television screen, you're not feeling the event. You can imagine the event. You can yeah. suggest what the event might be. And, of course, you can see how the football match unwinds. Not as well as you could if you're there. Yeah. But, um, you know, you, in a sense, you're acting as opposed to being real. Yes, um, okay. but it's a, I, I, you know, it's not a complaint. It's a, it's a necessary evil sometimes, and, and sadly, I suspect I haven't heard yet. They've, as you know, they've just done the Champions League draw, and I'm waiting to hear where I might go for that. But sadly, I think in the current climate, there'll be an awful lot of that done from um, yeah. studios as opposed to at the ground. Yeah, so it'd be, yeah, like you said, necessary evil, probably a little bit of commercial reality, and probably COVID. Added on top, yeah. it's probably going to uh, dictate that it might be a little bit more than we'd all like. Yeah. I, yes, I, I was speaking to a friend today about it, and and we felt that we 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 think we could sense when it was being done as well as a as a as a viewer yeah. um, and, and as a listener. So that's that's probably where we all agree, I guess. 
I'll tell you where you can. I'll tell you where it's very easy to work it out. An offside call. Yeah. Because the striker goes through, scores the goal. You can go wild, and you only see the offside flag when the director shows the picture of the offside flag. Yeah. And so you can go. You know, and sometimes the goal's disallowed and you don't know why and you don't know because you're completely in the hands of the commentator. And as a viewer, yeah. that's when you know. Yeah. Because you think, well, that's odd that the commentator didn't see that. And yeah. the commentator didn't see it just as you didn't see it. Um, and so, you know, never mind the event and all the kind of grand stuff. Yeah. Actually, sometimes seeing the game yeah. um, is difficult. Yeah, it does hinder you, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, again, I was listening to different commentaries, and obviously there's some highlighted ones, and and, and I'm going to share one uh, in a moment, um, which is a pretty obvious one, the Roma one that we, we'll go through. Um, but I was not as a critic, but just as an observer and a listener, and I felt that your peripheral vision while you were commentating was sensational, um, which is good for a coach, is great for a player, and it's great for any critic um, if you're at the ground because obviously it's hard, a little bit harder on TV, but you can manage on TV on the wide shot. But I felt like you were calling two or three situations in the one instance, like the, for what the memory the guy was flying down the wing, can't remember who it was, and you were calling who was in inside waiting for the cross. Um, and and I, from the technical point of view, I was thinking to myself, that's that's good information, that's added information. You're you're just not ball watching, which is it. A good, good football <laughs> analogy. Well, that that's nice of you to say, George. I do you know what um, th this this may sound as though I'm being sort of deliberately self-effacing. No, I, I li listen on on a good day. On a good day, that that's really pleasing to hear that that you enjoy that. But I, I also think, oddly enough, it's a bit about looking after myself. You know, when if somebody is flying down the wing. And I see a couple of people going into the middle. I think, right, they're the guys who are going to score the goal. So it's almost reciting out loud. You know, Jones is in the middle, Smith's in the middle. And I'm like saying to myself, when this ball comes over, it's going to be either Jones or Smith. Yeah. Yeah. So get yeah. ready. You yeah. know, so and, and if that works, if you know, that's a sort of two sided coin that works for the viewer and works for me, then that's really good. And it's particularly true uh, if you have a free kick sort of. 10 yards outside the penalty area. Yeah. And so two big centre-halves come forward and the centre-forward and the big strong midfield player. And you think one of these is going to be the one that gets a header. And so I quite often find myself saying, I hope for the benefit of the viewer, but certainly for the benefit of me, you know, X is just in front of the penalty spot. Y is just behind it. Z is round the back post. And, and so um, I, I guess that is good information. Yeah, it is but, good um, but but I, but I'm probably being slightly selfish about it too, and thinking, right, you know, getting in my head which is which. Yeah. Oh well, you're ticking both boxes, which is probably good. And if one takes care of the other, that's that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's just go again with another soundbite. And that You would have heard it a million times. I'm sure you're sick of hearing it. Um, it is an exceptional piece of poetry. Um, take, take us back to the moment. Yeah. I mean, it's really kind of you to say, George, in, in a way, you've got to say it's a bit bizarre. Um, uh, as, as far as I know, Manolas isn't from Mount Olympus. But, <laughs> not, um, not, many, but, not many modern Greeks are. <laughs> no, no, exactly. <laughs> um, the, the, um, the, this is the truth of it. Um, that night, Liverpool were playing Manchester City on the other channel yep. in the Champions League. Roma against Barcelona was not the main attraction. Um, I was lucky enough to be in the Olympic Stadium, Rome, uh, and pretty relaxed. My view was that if I was sitting at home, I wouldn't be watching a game which Barcelona had already wrapped up. 
Um, yeah. It was my privilege to be in one of the great stadia in Europe. Messi was playing, you know, what wasn't to like, enjoy, relax yeah. and enjoy. Yeah. And so I did. Um, and it wasn't really until Roma got to within one goal, I thought, blimey, man, um, you know, if they score again, this is going to be a big deal. Now, what also happened that night was that um, Liverpool eased away from Manchester City and that game became dull, which wasn't likely to happen. So the UK turned over because they heard that Barcelona might lose this. Yeah, yeah. So I started with nobody, um, really, apart from, you know, a clique. Yeah. Um, so so that so th these are this what I'm talking about here are planets aligning. OK, so uh, I it hadn't even occurred to me as I prepared for that game that anything was going to happen except, a, you know, Roma might win one nil, but who cares? Barcelona were going to go through routinely, but Roma gets to within one. And so um, I'm thinking, right, well, listen, just prepare. Just it, it was like sort of pinching myself or kicking myself in the shin and saying, just get up for this, man, because if they score again, you know, this will be, won't be a normal goal. Yeah. And so they score. And um, you'll be aware that it was a little near post flick from a centre half. Yeah. And in amongst the mellow players. And I didn't know who scored. So um, the uh, thing to do then is to find a, find some words to cover the gap. Yeah. And so while I waited for the director to show me a picture of Manolas. Uh, so uh, that, that was where Roma have risen from their ruins came into play. Um, and then, you know, that did its job. Saw it was Manolas. And what was the first thing I thought about? He's Greek. And so I went off on this slightly bizarre rant about a Greek in Rome. And, and, and honestly, I'm not on social media. Uh, um, and I'm really glad I'm not. I left the left the ground that night because I hadn't been particularly aware of the Liverpool Manchester City game and what it meant. Yeah. And so I left the ground that night, went off to have a beer and had, it, you know, I'd, I had completely left that game. It didn't occur to me that any, apart from the fact that it was a remarkable football match and we were buzzing because we'd seen this crazy thing happen. I didn't think as a broadcast, it was particularly going to resonate at all. Um, and it, it was only when people started start my my phone started ringing and saying, "Are you aware of what's going on here?" And I said, "No, not really." Um, and um, it's the, of of all the hundreds of European trips I've been on, it's and this probably indicates how relaxed I was. It's the only one I've ever brought my wife on. Okay, she came, and and the way her diary and my diary worked out. She came and we we arranged to have an extra day in Rome the next day and to do all the things you do in Rome, you know, the Colosseum and the yeah. Vatican and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, that day, my phone didn't stop ringing from people who wanted to talk about it, which was a lovely thing. It was a lovely thing. Um, and uh, let me tell you, this is not false modesty, a complete freak, you know, a complete fluke. But I, I, but I'm not going to pretend I didn't enjoy it because I did enjoy it. It was lovely. But it, again, it's it only goes to underline a couple of things. One, as a commentator, you are only as good as the event you are given. I didn't score that goal. Manolas scored that yep. goal. Yep. Yep. You know, I didn't play in that game. I happened to be the bloke who happened to be given the ticket to sit in a very nice seat and watch it. Um, and two as a commentator, you can't take too much notice of the fluff that goes around you because, um, okay, that was a nice moment, but out of every, you know, that is a goal in a thousand. Most goals that go in are just another goal that goes in and you get excited and move on. Yeah. Um, and it would be foolish to believe uh, that uh, that in any sense kind of elevated me. It was just, it was just, somebody else's moment that I was I was there um and some words came spilling out that seemed to work <laughs> no absolutely and I know you you'll play it down and it's it's your nature to do so but just from the sporting the theater point of view from an audience point of view you know when certain events important goals like you said or moments in 
in life or sport, horse racing, cricket, whatever it may be, um, if if the commentator happens to get it right at that particular point mm. and the two then fit together and go down yeah. in history together, one lives with the other forever and a day. Yeah. And we love it, that as theatre goers, as sports fans. Absolutely. I, and and um, uh, if that's the case for that, then that is lovely. You're right. It, it's a planet's aligning moment. And we could all, we could all quote, you know, moments. Yeah. Um, you know, goodness sake, I mean, probably the finest commentator of them all was your Richie Benno, you know, and, 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 and we, and we as English cricket lovers embraced him, yeah. you know, and when England, so, you know, don't get me wrong, you've thumped us plenty of times, but we won, we won the famous Ashes series in 2005 and he was commentating on British TV and, you know, um, Jones, Kasparovich, England of what, you know, and everybody can say it. And, and um, I know it's the same in Australia, but everybody, uh, sadly, he's been, not been with us for, for a few years now, yeah. but, you know, growing up, everybody could do Richie Benno. No, I, I just did another montage today on social media. Yeah. Uh, and I, I could not flick past it. I, I grew up, there's another one of those voices that we grew up with in our yeah. lounge rooms for 30 years. Like, yes. Uh, and yeah. he was the king of the one-liner. Um, yes, funny as all, but he underplayed it. But <laughs> yeah, he was in, his knowledge of cricket was exceptional, but his personality yeah. was just beautiful. Yeah, right beautiful. place, right time, yeah. and Richie. Correct. Had, and you had it yeah. deliberate. His timing yes. was sensational, and and that yeah. helps. And that in any sport. So again, I congratulate you not on just the Roma moment on a, on a full career because it's not the Roma moment. I the John Motson feeling. The Richie Benno feeling. I get that when I listen to your commentary when I am a fan sitting on the couch and, and I always hope week in, week out, not to offend any other commentator, but I want you to be um, the man at the mic with Jim when Liverpool are playing because it just makes all my planets align and makes me feel more comfortable. <laughs> well, thank you. That's really kind of you, George. Thank you. That's right. The other thing about getting all that to work together is that – the non-fluky part is there's a lot of preparation that goes in. So tell us about the prep that you do for each match. Yeah, I mean that's to, to be honest, that's the dull bit, and that is most of the week. You know, the the um, two hours of the football match are the culmination of what, well, on average, I, I, on average, I say a football match is a working day, what yeah. someone might call a nine to five day. Yeah. Um, now that varies according to what the match is. Um, you know, already I've done Liverpool a couple of times this season. So next time I do Liverpool, I've got at least a you know a broad idea. It's not difficult for me to research Liverpool. Most of the information is there. Yeah. The challenge is to find, I suppose, something a bit different from what I said last time. Um, if I start in the Champions League and I'm doing Krasnodar from Russia, that's a project that begins from you know so, so some. Some will require less than the full eight hours and some will require more. Some, obviously, I know the Liverpool players. If I had to do Krasnodar, I'm going to have to find some coverage of them and learn who they are and who looks like what and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So those eight preparatory hours on stats and so on are key. Um, and then I, I'm always at great lengths to say you must never prepare words for the live football because... The live football will never quite dovetail with the words, but I do take time to uh, make sure that my opening, you know, the team's coming out, the yes. readiness for yes. the game is, is, um, is prepared. Um, and then, then in the moment that actually one of the most important periods is the hour up to the game where the uh, players are out warming up. Because then, particularly again, if it's an unfamiliar team, this is where you... Um, you can really nail the identification because there's nothing more important in football commentary than being able to say the name of the player. Yeah. Um, and so, so the, um, if you've got two big centre halves who from 50 yards away look identical, those, that hour of um, warm up is when you see that one of them's got blue boots and one of them's got pink boots yeah. or yeah. one of them's had a haircut and one of them hasn't, or one of them's got short sleeves or one of them's got long sleeves, all of those things, which, which are, key and that that is really the most important thing if you do nothing else as a commentator 
and simply run through the names, well, that is the minimum requirement. Yeah. But if, if they run out and you're not quite sure who some of them are, and don't get me wrong, it's happened to me plenty yeah. of times. You yeah. think, well, I'm not quite sure. And you're sort of getting away with it. That, then you can, if you're not sure of the identification, you never quite settle in a game. You're always chasing your tail. If you know them all, then you can settle and, and do the job better. Yeah. I, I always quote an example way back, a Champions League game I did for ITV, where Cristiano Ronaldo scored with a wonderful diving header for Manchester United in Rome. Um, and all I saw through a crowded penalty area were his pink boots. You know, and this is just about the most famous player in the world, and it would have been a terrible goal scorer to get wrong. Um, but the fact is, he came through a crowd. I never saw him. All I saw were his boots. And if I hadn't taken the trouble beforehand just to take a note of it, oh, Ronaldo's got those pink boots on. Yeah. You know, I, I, rather than having a lovely sort of Ronaldo moment, I'd have had, and United have scored, and, you know, one of those sorts of moments. Yeah. I think waiting, <laughs> Which waiting. we all have, by the way, including yeah. me. I have plenty of them. Um, plenty of them. But uh, that's, that's the ideal anyway. Attention to detail and preparation is key. Yeah, oh, no, it is. Yeah. It is because because what it what all the notes I do, most of them you don't use. And if you did use, you'd be very dull because they're yeah. just a list of facts and figures. Yeah. And you have to try and tailor them to the moment that they're required. But what they are ultimately is a comfort blanket. Because they are they are the base on which you can then expand. Yeah. Uh, because you know that there's somewhere to go. You're not gonna dry. There's something on those pieces of A4 paper in front of you, which will dig you out. And the knowledge that that is there um, just just sets you free. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. Um, what I do with the guests normally is I like to play a, a little imaginary five-a-side schoolyard game. Um, <laughs> hey. And it puts you on the spot a bit, but, hey, we'll have a bit of fun. Um, yeah, yeah. So, well, it's toss the coin, you, you're the captain, I'm the captain, you win the toss and you get first choice. And I'll throw up a couple of options here for you of each position um, of this imaginary game. And I've, I've added a little bit of an Australian feel oh. to a Premier League sort of all-stars type scenario. So uh, you've won the toss, you've got to choose the goalkeepers, you've got to choose between Mark Schwarzer and Mark Bosnich. Oh, now you see, this depends whether it's a one off game or a whole season. No, just, just the lunchtime by the side. Just you just want to really win today. Side. Yeah, I'll go Bosnich for flair. Okay, very good. If I was playing mm. a 38 game season, I'd go Schwartz for consistency. Yeah, gotcha. Makes good sense. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Uh, the defenders I've chosen, I've gone for two Premier League stars of, of different eras, but let's go Tony Adams or Vincent Company. Wow. I mean, they're more or less the same person in my head. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'll, I'll go company because he's younger now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, we'll go with that. Um, the, the standard Premier League question, and I was going to play around with it, but I thought, no, it's only fair I should ask. Central midfield, Gerard or Lampard? Oh, you see, Lampard won more, but I've got a thing for Gerard. I'm going to go Gerard. Okay, I'm disappointed that I've ended up with Lampard, but I'm glad you. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad yeah, you sorry. picked Stevie G. Okay, so I'd, I'd happily make the swap. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, our striker slash goal scorer. Uh, this is another one of the Australian flavour. Viduka or Timmy Cale? Oh, yeah. It's the same sort of choice as the goalkeeper, really. You'd want Cahill in your team forever. But Viduka just more likely to win the one-off game. So I'm going to go with Viduka for my lunchtime five-a-side. Okay. But uh, you're not sorry to have Cahill. I'm not sorry to have Timmy because he, he, he'll score a goal. But my favourite, or I think the most gifted Australian player we've ever had, and probably my favourite of all time, is Mark Viduka. I just... yeah. I, yeah, it it makes my mouth water when I think of skillful, strong number nines to build your team around. Yeah. Well, I, I was reminded of him the other day preparing for Liverpool-Leeds, that famous game where he scored yeah. four for Leeds. Yeah. yeah. 
It was the only time in my life I was happy to see Liverpool lose. Oh, yeah, you must have been torn. I was torn. I came home from the <laughs> wedding and I, I had set the, the, as we did in those days, the video recorder, played it back, didn't know the scores, watched it unfold, and I should have been disappointed with Liverpool, uh, but I love Mark and I thought, well, he's on the world yeah. stage and he's tore it up and he, yeah. he was just something special. And the, the last one I've, I've gone is a little bit different. I've gone for the eccentric type, well, the eccentric type, um, bag of everything with these two guys, <laughs> Di Canio <laughs> or Cantona? Oh, wow, well, <laughs> uh, amazing. Uh, two, two great <laughs> players, two great players, and I love them both. Honestly, we need people like that, both of them. Uh, I'm going to go, I think you've got to go Cantona, actually. You've got to go Cantona, because... As brilliant as the Canio was in the moment, uh, Cantona was brilliant almost every week. Uh, so Cantona. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's fair enough. I just thought <laughs> I'd pick something different there. And Yeah, uh, no, that's a good choice. Two eccentrics, and I, and I think I found them. I could have yeah. less eccentric, but just as explosive and talented. I could have thrown in Zola just to make the decision even yeah. harder, but... Um, yeah, that would have been hard. That would yeah. have been hard. Um, once again, I really do appreciate that you've um, taken some time out to, to have a chat. It's been an absolute pleasure, one, to chat to you and to, to learn a little bit more about you uh, through the research and through our conversation. Um, rest assured, we do listen. We do pay attention. We, we are passionate. We've had silly people in this country tell us that we can't be Liverpool or Man U supporters because we weren't born or Watford supporters because we weren't born in the north of London. We are just as passionate as the English folk. And I think the fact that we get up at crazy hours uh, for 20, 25 years straight and don't miss a game <laughs> I think proves that we're, yeah. well, if not passionate, definitely crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are. You yeah. are. And um, by the way, let me tell you, George, we appreciate it too. Honestly, we do. Um, please don't take that for, you know, as if as if I'm just saying it back to you automatically we are when we do these games we are very very aware that you guys in Australia there's a core of you who follow our league and we're you know that's that that is a large part of what gives us the thrill so thank you for being there and, and supporting it not a problem uh, please continue enjoying the game please continue bringing uh, your excitement your poetry your flair and the entertainment value um, and I look forward to listening to that beautiful voice next time I'm on the couch. Hopefully next week, well, it won't be next weekend because of international football, but in a couple of weeks. Um, and fingers crossed you end up at the Merseyside Derby. That could be an interesting affair. <laughs> Looking forward to that. And um, not bad for you in terms of time zone, is it? Um, doesn't really matter. It's a matter. lunchtime game, our time. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but that's, that's, that's a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, Good Peter. stuff. Thank you for Cheers, your time. George. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.